One of the books that we had to read in high school was A Tale of Two Cities. And it begins with, it was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. And that's quite significant because that reflects upon my experience in Evanston. Evanston at one time was the most segregated place there was. African Americans felt as second in class citizens. The beaches were segregated. The retail stores were segregated. Schools were segregated. Some of the finest basketball players in Chicago area, but they, 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 they didn't play on the Emerson Township High School basketball team. White children had their prom at the country club, and the black kids had theirs where they could. The Evanston was so rigid as far as uh, segregation uh, that I didn't realize that there were no Jews living in Evanston. I, I think there may be two or three families. Northwestern University was segregated, uh, housing was segregated. And the Grove Street YMCA was segregated. I love Evanston, but uh, that's the fact of life. If you lived in the Fifth Ward, which you did, and back then most of us lived in the same zip code, unlike now. And so therefore, everybody knew everybody. See, Everston wasn't that big. You went from Darrell <laughs> to Brown, from Church Street to Simpson. Well, some people lived on Garnett. I, I don't know them because we, there was always a fight between the Garnett gang and the Brown Street gang. Went to church on Sundays. Uh, on Saturday night during the summer, we'd have neighborhood night. We knew every home that the teenagers who lived in from the time we crossed uh, the railroad tracks at Ridge Avenue till we got to the canal. Hopscotch going on in one alley. Kids would ride their bicycles and play marbles. Double Dutch on the other alley. At that time, Everson had a lot of singing groups. Groups that did doo-wops, street corner singing like, I'm an ever spinning top, whirling around till I drop. We had more of a village back then. Walk down the street, say, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, you know, good evening. People would come home and they would see us out playing and they said, have you kids had your dinner yet? No, my parents are still at work. Why don't you come over to the house and eat? Good cooks back in those days, and they they really looked out for the people in the neighborhoods. I don't remember my mom locking the doors. I guess nobody knew where the key was to the house. A lot of times we would come back, and one of our friends would be sitting in our living room waiting on us to come home. It smelled like apple blossom time when we got here. It was just all over the place, just like love. That's what it was, love. Mm. Everybody helped to raise you, and it was fun. And you know you were on your best behavior, because you better be. <laughs> that was one of the things that, you know, was expected of you. Well, when we came along, my mother and them had a grapevine. That no matter what you did, if it was wrong. I saw Carl on Dewey and Emerson, and uh, he was throwing tomatoes at this car that was going by, and so. They heard about it. If you got into trouble on the streets before I got home, some adult would see me on the street and they would say, come here. And then they got on our case about what had happened. And she knew before I got home. A member of the village had told uh, my parents. I understand, my mother used to start out with that, I understand you stopped at such and such a place. No, I didn't. So I guess they're telling a lie on you. I said, I ain't called nobody a lie. Now, if you got a good grade in school, when you was in school, everybody in the neighborhood knew it, and somebody would cook you a cake or a rose. The police officers knew your parents. Um, the school teachers knew your parents, uh, and the firemen knew your parents. And you prayed to God the teacher never stopped at your house. All the officers of those days, you know, they all lived here. The Sunday school teacher, the pastor of the church, we were all kind of one. It's like a family. You know, it's really like a family. I have a lot of fond memories of Emerson Street YMCA. A lot of fond memories. It was like your home away from home. That's the only place we could go. 
That was a focal point of our social activity. We went there for summer programs. We went there for after school programs. When it got time for school to be out, I started twitching. We used to say we'd take a shortcut to the wire. Why well, would open up about 4.30? and everybody was lined up outside. That's where I was introduced to boxing. Yeah, we had a little boxing club. Pool, judo, ping pong. Oh, I got good at that. Had a lot of good friends. Um, still, we're still friends today, as a matter of fact. Fondest memory I had was the time I spent there with my father. Shooting pool with my dad, and actually shooting one of the cue balls, the correct ball, into a hole the father and son banquet. That was so special that I could go to a dinner with my dad to a banquet. And I looked forward to that every year because back then it was, you know, all of us, nine of us, you know, I mean, I never had a chance to go out to dinner with my dad. My dad couldn't afford it. He was a domestic worker. But every year to go to that dinner and sit there with my dad and my brothers, my other two brothers at the time, and be with my dad and with all the men. It was fantastic. My Saturday mornings were wonderful because I knew I was going to the Y and I knew I was going with my dad. I was taught how to swim by Mr. Boyd and learned how to swim and would go every Tuesday and Thursday. They had a whole ritual of what you had to do before you could get in the pool. There were all these doors. You had to take a shower first. And they would check your wrists and they would rub it like this. And if we had dirt, they would send us back to the showers. And then next time they, they rub your, your, your ankles down there. And, if, and so it took a while before you got in the pool. But it was just amazing because we swam naked. Nobody's ever explained to us why we had to swim naked. The girls wore swimming suits. They always had the pool first, and then we had to wait till they got out of the pool and get dressed, and then we could go in and go in the pool. So it was kind of tricky at times. Ted was like a fish in the water. I mean, he could break a wave, and you wouldn't even know it. He was smooth. I mean, he's, he's just sort of smooth, silent, quiet, just water. And he'd always used to say, you know, I can teach anybody to swim in 10 minutes. And he started all of us on the side of the pool doing a flutter kick. He was a good instructor, and he, I think he realized that I was frightened of the water. Mr. Boyd was a very interesting guy because uh, he knew when you was ready for that deep pool. He said, well, Jim, how do you feel about, you know, swimming in the deep water now? And I go, mm, I don't think I'm ready for that now. If you wouldn't get in, into it on your own, when you walked around that pool, what he would do is hit you on your arm and you would flop into the pool. He said, okay, now swim across. And I'm floundering in the water. And you could hear the other kids on the side telling me to go, 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 and everybody was screaming and holler. I said, God, I can swim in deep water now. Oh, that was wonderful. He knew when you were ready, even before you did. Then I got enough nerve to get on the diving board. I did my belly flops. I I did my somersaults. And I remember he kept telling me, jump. And he said to myself, you want me to jump, you better push me. Every guy thought he was a man when he could do the jackknife. No, I didn't scream. I felt like hitting him, though. <laughs> you know, that gave me a, a, a feeling of power because there wasn't that many girls that would go off that diving board. We'd go down to the lakefront and jump off the pier into Lake Michigan, because we knew how to swim. We knew how to swim. And that was, that was a good day. That was a, that was a real good day. My dad was very talented in the water, and he passed that on to me. He was a main influence on uh, my life and the life of many of my friends, I know that. I cared about what he thought, and he cared about us. It's funny how one person can leave an impression on you that last your whole life. Gave it to so many kids. The Y provided a, a whole range from preschool all the way up to adults and everything in between. Well, I stayed at the Emerson Street YMCA uh, uh, during the time that I was going to Roosevelt University. Uh, it was my home. and my workplace. 
and I, I enjoyed it there. I felt grateful. I, I, uh, there wasn't any institution of that kind, and that was at all for, for black people. Ralph Munch came to do summer school at Northwestern, and uh, Y was the only place where he could stay at that time. The other thing that impressed me so much, I miss so much in this community, was the mentoring ship. You looked at them like a father figure. Not only talk the talk, they walk the walk. Expectations were very high. They taught us a lot about being kind to other people, doing things, and service. Those values have lasted a lifetime. I was further in high Y as a senior in high school, and they had the tri Y, which was the female uh, gathering of teenagers. As a president, I tried to get them involved in, in uh, black history, too. We learned the black national anthem. We learned about Langston Hughes. Uh, Thurgood Marshall and um, uh, the local uh, alderman who was the first black alderman, Mr. Jordan, the people who were the greatest in that, and so you could aspire to become like them. And during that particular time, they did not have a chapter of the Phalanx Fraternity. In October of 58 is when we established our chapter and uh, we began to have our fraternity meetings there. Every group of students, the black students who came, uh, there was a reception for them. There was this good looking gentleman there who gave his name, James T. Morton. If it had not been for the Emerson Street Williams, I, I don't think we would have ever hitched up. <laughs> A lot of the organizations had teas there, white tablecloths, and your gloves, your Sunday best. Most of the time I went with my mother and a bunch of them would make sandwich loaves. Tea sandwiches and cucumber sandwiches and all of that. All the little flouncy dresses, bowls in, in your hair that I hated. I always wanted to be a boy, I didn't want, I don't know, I just thought boys had all of the advantages. You see, in those days, the wild mostly was for the men, for the boys. I like to shoot marbles, uh, hop the train, <laughs> the freight that was going by foster school. I was a tomboy. They, at the Y, they played checkers and chess. You had tournaments, you had tech checker tournaments. You're sitting there all around studying. We had the checker champ. I think he was third best in the world come through there. We called him Junior. When he passed away, he left us the checkerboard. You had so much talent that just came up to the Y that you wouldn't even believe. They turned out some top athletes. We formed a, a, a basketball team which was known as the Bobolinks. And then the Clippers were the older team that played at the Y. Then we started playing teams from Waukegan, from Proviso, and from Chicago in particular. That was like the rivalry between Evanston and New Trier. <laughs> the Emerson Y and the, and the Wabash Y. He said, I was determined I was going to beat Evanston and that little Cracker Jack Jim. Never did. <laughs> Never did. <laughs> and sometimes the teams would travel and some of the kids were able to do, they would travel to support the teams. Back then, we didn't get a chance to really get out the neighborhood. And that was, that was like taking a trip to Arizona. And I remember the coach, he said, be the best athlete that you can be. And, and what, what I liked about it is that he tied it not only to athletics, but he tied it to our lives. Whole community would come when we had games that we played against these other teams. I'm telling you, that place would be packed to the rafters. You know, if the Emerson Y, they had um, a balcony. Boy, that balcony would be crowded. I figured there was too many people up there that uh, it was coming down. <laughs> They're cheered and hollering and carried on. One thing about the gym is it was a built way a long time ago. It was so small that the outer bounds were the walls. <laughs> when you laid one up, you ran. <laughs> Bam! You'd kill yourself up there. It, it was bouncing off the wall. <laughs> it wasn't no, you know, space behind that. Uh-uh. Dodge the players like when they <laughs> fell on us. Oh, we diving after balls and uh, you know. Mm -mm. Put on some knee pads, brother, because you was getting down there. Mm. Of course, most of the girls that were interested in the basketball players. I tease her all the time. I said, you saw me playing basketball in high school, and uh, you uh, said, I'm going to get that guy one day. He says 
that I had my eye on him back in those days. And I'm not so sure about that, but I did think he was a wonderful basketball player. They also had girl cheerleaders. So back then they had pom-poms and they would do the dance to the music and all that. And it was just an aura. Probably the most thing that stands out in my head because it was like the noise was just overwhelming. That was the place to be because the place rocked. <laughs> it rocked. <laughs> and they cooked uh, pork and beans and hot dogs. The team that lost only got to eat the pork and beans and the team that won got the beans and the hot dogs. And you talk about some of the great games, we enjoyed that. All over the country, kids were going and getting scholarships to play, and that's the way they got their sales through college. I've never stopped to reflect on things that had an impact upon me when I was young. And uh, you know, this why was one of the main ones that did that. I guess it was the senior prom. I think that was the highlight of my experience. There was the white prom at the high school, and the black kids went to the Y for their prom. Well, the prom, we'd go down and rent our tuxes, and the girls would get all dressed up, and we'd get their corsages. And... I got a chance to wear my first, I say, adult formal gown. And there was a girl there that had the same dress on that I had on, which was devastating. <laughs> Powder blue and peach uh, with a huge skirt with all these different panels. And I was so excited. And then as I think about that dress today, it was so ugly. <laughs> and sometimes we had our own little band. Well, I, I played the piano. The real talent of the group was a young man uh, named Ernest McDonald. Billy Wright, who had a band. Of course, uh, Nat King Cole came there a couple of times. Oh, that was heaven then. He hadn't become as famous. He could play a piano. He could truly play the piano. Yes, he could do the works. Freddie Cole was a young person that came back and forth. He used to play in Evanston, come down and, and go out with girls and play basketball and play music. Yeah, a lot of friends, a lot of memories. Some of which I'll never tell. <laughs> Every Friday night was a great dance and we'd all come dressed to the nines. Bobby socks, white shoes, brown shoes, poof. We thought the orbit room was really cool because it had planets on the wall and, and it had stars in the ceiling. And the you know, lights would twinkle, you know, like stars. And there was a moon that hung over here and red and blue lights would flicker on and off. And we'd laugh and we'd talk and we'd drink sodas and we'd dance and, and we just, we had a great time. Soul Records, The Temptations, Supremes, James Brown. What we would do was try to do the dances that we would see on American Bandstand. And um, also, um, we had heard that there were a lot of beautiful girls from, uh, from Foster that would always be hanging out. I've always been tall, uh, and so therefore, you know, you just have to hope somebody that's going to be taller than you will ask you to dance. I was kind of shy, especially girls. Yeah. There's always more girls than boys, I can tell you that. That helped me overcome that. A lot of times the boys would be on one side of the room and the girls would be on the other side of the room. It was always like a nervous energy that went through you when a song came on that blew your mind. You know, always hope that you see somebody that uh, you, uh, you could catch, you know. Then you were going to walk across the, the dance floor to a particular young lady and ask her for a dance and uh, hopefully whisper something nice to her. And you go down and dance and you dance in between the lights and it, the mood was just, we were chaperone in those days. My mother on occasion acted as a chaperone. Like if those guys turned their back and leave us for a minute, the lights went down. She could have stayed at home. And uh, Everybody got an opportunity to dance with their favorite girlfriend. You dance with the, the love of your life, you know. It was, it was an exciting moment. I met the love of my life. 
going to the YMCA. And that was my first kiss. And I was in love. I did have my first kiss uh, there. And uh... while you were dancing, depending on what the music was, you sink a little kiss. Oh, yeah, I got a few good kisses there. <laughs> Not me. I was a good boy. So, yeah, that was, with beyond a shadow of a doubt, the best experience that I could have pulled from the Emerson Street Wire. My mother and father said, now, you can't leave the Y at 12 o'clock. You have to be home at 12 o'clock. Probably the most fun for me was um, leaving the Y, and again, when the party's over, and then you got a chance to walk your girl or your, your hope-to-be girl home. Everybody that lived on the west side kind of came along together, and then there was a little restaurant called the Do Drop In. And uh, they would have the fried bologna sandwiches, and they were the best. Loved them. No one could make better sandwiches than that. And I wished I knew how uh, what they used to make the sauce that they put on the bologna sandwich, because it was to die for. A fried bologna sandwich, you got, uh, you got people outside that are waiting. It was good, though. But it was always a giveaway the next day because the place was so small that the odor of the food would be in your clothes. So if I stopped, <laughs> she always knew. <laughs> Most of the time, the mother was waiting at the door to open the door to let her daughter in so that uh, uh, you didn't have any uh, chance to get involved in any kind of smooching or anything like that because the mother was waiting there to open the door. And you'd say goodnight to each other. And that was it. See you tomorrow. I would be the last one to go home and I'd be by myself. <laughs> Just, you know, lasting, lasting memories. There were so many changes going on, so many other social things going on through the civil rights uh, era. They had two separate Ys, which they said the Emerson Street Y and the Grocery Y, but we known it as the Black Y and the White Y. I mean, it was never a sign out that said for whites only, but it was implied for most of the black community. Why have two Y's? Why have a black Y and a white Y? I wanted to go there because I felt that I was not an inferior or minority anything. So we pulled up in front of the Y in our squad car, in our uniforms get out with guns on our hips. We walked in there to the counter there and said, we want memberships to the Y. And they said, uh, the guy said, I'm sorry, we don't allow no Negroes to join. And I'll never forget that the executive director told Tom, well, and I'm sitting there listening to this. You know, I don't think he'll feel comfortable here. It made me feel unequal. It was not a welcoming place for African-American youth, for black youth. Um, or for those who were um, outside the, the mainstream in Evanston at the time. I mean, I felt uh, uh, very comfortable at the, um, at the Emerson Street Y. I was with my friends. I was with people that loved me, cared about me, uh, respected me. There's a lot of mixed emotions about the, when the Y closed, and, and there's a lot of mixed emotions about integration. And some people, some people uh, have never gotten over it. Some people have never gotten over the fact that uh, they close our Y. And my cousin was on the board and he apparently voted to close the Y. I think the problem was they couldn't get any money. A lot of people didn't understand that they didn't own the Y, that the Evanston Y owned the Y. It was just a time where it seems like the dominoes were falling and that was one last thing that we could hold on to to call our own. They had nowhere for the kids to go. Foster school was closed. The community hospital was closed. The Y was closed. It was devastating to have the Y to be torn down, to see it being torn down. Then when we were finally invited to go to the Mogal Y. Since you, 
you were being segregated for so many years. I told Cheryl, I told my wife, I said, you know, it's no way. Uh, sometimes I think people mistake um, hurt for anger, and it's not anger, it's just hurt. And I think if it had not been for my grandson and my son, I probably never would have gone. I, I told her, no way. But she, <laughs> she gave me my therapy. <laughs> And we've made tremendous progress. We've done a lot of wonderful things, and this city has grown in leaps and bounds. Later in my, in my career, of course, I became a member of the board. <laughs> I've been in there you know, plenty of times, and I've had my kids um, going to activities. So you do anything, almost anything, for your children. So uh, I let it happen. I later became the first uh, African-American uh, chairman of the board. And now, for my grandkids, who go to the Y all the time, that's their history. We need to be reaching out into the community and being far more than a building, being part of that village that includes the faith community, that includes the school, that includes the neighborhood. The Emerson Street branch did that in amazing ways for generations. It's such an important part of Evanston's history. It's what I learned from my grandmother who had come to Evanston as maids and butlers and were able to see their grandchildren go away to college and come back as doctors and lawyers and teachers. The Y has helped mold and shape me to be the person that I am today. It's a story that needs to be told. Be with me until I leave this earth. We won't forget it. We won't ever forget it. Unforgettable. In every way. And forevermore. is how you stay That's why darling it's incredible That someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too